Attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Rocks for Brains, The Grand Checkerboard, and Splatter Soundtracks. Plus this day in history with the Pluto flyby and our song of the day by Nine Inch Nails on your Morning Monarchy for July 14th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another listener-supported blast of independent, non-commercial, alternative media streaming live from MediaMonarchy.com. listen We are here every weekday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Love it when you listen live. Or if you listen later... Via the feed, via the anyway. We are glad you're here for a little bit of fear-free news. Again, I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so very much more. It is Friday. That's when we look at the entertainment industrial complex, and you guys are hitting me up with stories in the chat just right up until showtime. I appreciate that. We are crowdfunded and crowdsourced, and a huge thanks to our latest patron. That's Phil D. Huge thanks to Phil. He went to patreon.com slash media monarchy and signed up to give us that little bit of monthly support that we need to keep going and growing and moving and grooving. There is a lot of breaking, a lot of breaking lamestream news that we'll include on this entertainment industrial complex episode. We call it media memes on Friday, and all the stories that we're about to talk about you can find at the top of the tweets. That's also where you can find the invitation to the chat. We love it when you hang out with us in the chat. Time Fox, Seb, Swag, appreciate you. More Trump Jr. revelations, of course, each and every day. Fact-checking Donald Trump's comments about campaign meeting with Russian lawyers. The Russian paranoia continues to build. The breaking and developing story we talked about yesterday now has an update. After Pennsylvania man confesses to role in slaying of four, questions remain in the case. Grandparents and other extended relatives exempt from Trump travel ban. J.P. Morgan posts higher profits as they help fill the swamp. Oh, wait, is that more Goldman Sachs? I guess so. The Bezos Post claims Trump revels in French military pomp far from White House turmoil. And, of course, Macron and Trump have decided, all right, regime change in Syria ain't going to happen. And, yes, it is Bastille Day. We'll play a little Bastille Day a little bit later in the day on our daily DJ set at noon. You get a morning monarchy, you get a pump up the volume this week, you've had good news next week, new world next week, and it is all brought to you by you. The UK continues to fall apart with London acid attacks. Five men assaulted in one night. That's two arrested. And again, those are developing stories. A couple other developing breaking stories. And again, I just got this in the chat. Walking Dead filming stops after stuntman death. Stuntman John Berniker has died after suffering a fall on the set of AMC's Walking Dead. AMC Network said production on eight season. I stopped after about five. And we've joked many, many times. Most TV shows should probably only go to like three seasons. It's downhill after that. They shut down production on the eighth season of the hit zombie TV series temporarily after Wednesday's tragic accident. A coroner in Georgia, and that's where they pretty much filmed that entire series, confirmed Berniker died of blunt force trauma in the hospital in Atlanta. The stuntman's other credits include Black Panther, Logan, and the 2015 version of Fantastic Four. So pretty much nothing but comic book movies. And The Walking Dead is a comic book turned TV series. Now, interestingly enough, Cassie and I last night when we were having a little bit of dinner, click on YouTube and flick around, and what did I land on? Watch Mojo's top 10 most controversial album covers. And there were some crazy ones in there that I'd never heard of. And in a way, if you include metal album covers in most controversy, it kind of just tips the whole thing to metal. You should have the top 10 non metal most controversial album covers. Number 10 on their list was as nasty as they want to be. I distinctly recall hearing for the first time the two live crew when I was at Myrtle Beach as a kid. Somebody had it on cassette tape, and I remember sitting at the edge of the water, listening to the most filthy music I'd ever heard, sitting in, of course, one of the more beautiful places in the world. I have kind of effect on you as a little kid. Christopher Fresh Kid Ice Wong Wan, founding member of the groundbreaking rap group Two Live Crew, and a pioneer for Asian rappers, has died at the age of 53. Former bandmates Luther Campbell and Brother Marquis announced Fresh Kid's death Thursday. One died early Thursday in a Miami hospital from health complications. People, we lost a legend, Luke Skywalker Luther Campbell said over social media. The other media meme story that is developing as I come to you right now, every time I turn around, Cat's got the hands out wanting something from me. Hip-hop legend DMX lamented in his 2003 hit, X gonna give it to you. I ain't got it, so you can't give it. Let's leave it at that, because I ain't with it. DMX was, of course, talking about his hard scrabble journey to the top of the hip-hop game, but if federal prosecutors in New York are to be believed, which that's a giant question, 
he might as well have been discussing his thefts. His income tax. On Thursday, DMX was charged with a 14-count indictment with concealing millions of dollars in income from the Internal Revenue Service and dodging some $1.7 million in federal theft liabilities. 46-year-old rapper, whose given name is Earl Simmons, is really just a shit magnet, isn't he? He's always got something terrible going on. Horrible things with dogs. And, of course, the unforgettable video of him I don't know if he's acting or overblowing it or not, but just doesn't really seem to grasp how the internet works. The other bit of breaking news I see this morning on the lame stream, SoundCloud, which we have talked about for you this week and previous weeks. New York Magazine calls it the popular music and podcast service that is the closest thing on the internet to a YouTube for audio, and that's pretty much what they've been calling it and what people sort of hopefully called it for many, many years. They appear to be in dire straits. Yesterday, TechCrunch reported that an all-hands meeting this month concerning layoffs that affected 40% of the company's staff, management revealed that the site only had enough, enough runway left to get them to the fourth quarter of this year. That's only 50 days from now. SoundCloud disputed the figure, telling the site was fully funded into fourth quarter and speaking with investors. The potential death of SoundCloud should scare music lovers, and that's what New York Magazine writes, and they are damn right, and we've talked about this many, 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 many times here. You think those things are going to last forever? Poor Blockbuster, I mention them all the time, they're just <laughs> the example for everything. It's like, oh, <laughs> see, it's hard when you don't use Millhouse as an example. We thought Blockbuster was going to be around forever, and they are still lasting, there's still a couple of them, although they're being closed in Alaska every other week thought that was going to last forever. We think Facebook is going to last forever. You think YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, Kanye suing Tidal for $3 million? Oh, I'm sure it's going to last forever. That's why I've said here all the time, and that's why you see in the background of every video that I make, a pretty big record collection. That is a physical thing that no one can take away. Think about how we talk about tangible assets, talk about holding gold, holding things that mean something, that have real value. I think my record collection has real value. It's something I've worked on essentially all my life. And it means something. I know everything about every single piece I have. And one little bad business decision or the whims of some board of directors is not going to change that. This has been the realization these many years as we all have fully dived into the interwebs, realizing maybe what we've left behind, what we've lost, and what we could lose. So don't let all that stuff disappear when Spotify goes out of business. All those virtual playlists, all those things will be gone overnight. So I think it's good to deal in tangible assets, so to speak. In dealing in those tangible assets, that's how you help those bands. I have a hard time thinking that buying a band's record on Bandcamp helps them as much as going to see them at a club, paying the money to see them at a club, and putting the money in their hands and buying a t-shirt or buying a record or buying something physical. Now again, I still wholeheartedly support bands on Bandcamp. That's one of the best platforms out there. I rue the day that, of course, Bandcamp will probably sell out. And we were talking about Pacific Foods, the Oregon-based organic soup maker selling out to Campbell's this week. And one of our friends in the chat, who is perhaps slightly older than maybe some of us, said, yeah, and you're 60 years old and someone hands you $700 million, it's probably going to be kind of hard to walk away. It smells like a ridiculous thing being cooked up, and you are listening to your Morning Monarchy for Friday, Bastille Day, July 14th, 2017. Glad you're here. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. The idiocracy is just rationing up at, at unbelievable levels. And I think we could really achieve idiocracy if you vote for a former professional wrestler. Now, we've got a guy in an office right now who liked to play around with wrestling. He liked to do some appearances, but it was mostly PR. But we're going to get an actual professional wrestler in the White House. Shit. Dwayne The Rock Johnson be cooking up a presidential campaign. An organization called Run The Rock 2020 filed paperwork with the Federal Election Commission this week to support a potential Johnson candidacy. Our political analyst John Keller has more. Good morning. At this moment of political discord and bitter partisanship, it's nice to daydream about a future time when our leadership 
is both seriously devoted to the idea of healing our wounds and bringing people together and possessed of the personal skills to do so. Whatever other qualities he may possess, the current president doesn't seem to fit that bill, nor is there a prominent Democrat who immediately comes to mind. So is there someone out there who can turn this floundering ship of state into something resembling a love boat? If you smell what the rock is cooking. For those who've been living under a rock, this is Dwayne The Rock Johnson, a former pro wrestler who has become the biggest box office draw in the movie business. And in recent months, he has joined a growing chorus of speculation about a possible 2020 presidential run. If that would ever happen, if I were ever to run for president, I would, I would do a deep dive, obviously, into policy and understand a lot better than I do today, surround myself with great people. Sounds good, doesn't it? The Rock is an independent who has appeared at both party conventions. He's organized events for our troops, raised funds to help kids overcome criminal backgrounds, and made himself into a wildly successful entrepreneur. If he's made any enemies along the way, we haven't heard about them. And in a recent magazine interview, where The Rock talked at length about how he managed things in the White House, he emphasized listening to critics and being a unifying force, not a divisive one. The Rock for president in 2020? Raise an eyebrow if you like, but don't laugh. So that's some um, local news goober with his look at me acting like a talk tough segment that the local news lets him do. Kind of reminds me of, hey, remember that guy Ben Swan? The hell happened to that guy? I love when things like this happen. It bears, it lays bare the ridiculousness of our situation. So I just like the idea of people getting all bent out of shape. Oh my God, Rock, that's just crazy. You're voting for politicians and businessmen. I much prefer to have my leaders be multi-generational serial killers who are on the record as having started multiple wars of resources. Rock may be a big wrestling dumbass, but last time I checked, he hasn't killed little kids in Syria. Not yet. But that's what you do when you get in office. And you'll run on a bunch of blah 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 but once you get in, they'll show you the movie. And that's how it rolls. Now, can this idiocy get any greater? You bet your ass it can. Rockin' Capitol Hill, Kid Rock confirming that he is making a run for the Senate in Michigan. The musician took to Twitter yesterday writing this. I have had a ton of emails and texts asking me if this website is real. The answer is an absolute yes. If Kid Rock wins, he would be the first Republican candidate to win the Senate seat since 1998. Want to bring in the host of Fox News Radio's The Tom Shalhoub Show uh, and author of Mean Dad for a Better America. Tom Shalhoub, it's time to see you. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for joining the conversation. What Great do you think? What, what are his chances of winning, Kid Rock? Uh, I think if he runs, he's, he'll win. I mean, huh. it's, I think it's that simple. He's got, he's got huge appeal. And he will have turnout. That's all you need these days is turnout. And he will bring extra people to the polls and he would win. I mean, if you're a Republican, this doesn't work as well for Democrats. Celebrities, Democrats, they, they don't have the pulse of the American people. But Kid Rock, I mean, Kid Rock, he's America. Yeah, I mean, he does have the, he, he does, you think so, right? Yeah, yeah Tom, I, I mean, as I, as I told you, I'm a huge Kid Rock fan. You yeah. know, I think I own all his albums. Uh, I can't think of a more perfect personification of the American id in the Trump era than <laughs> Kid Rock. Exactly. You know, wow. Campaigning in a, you know, maybe get a, a minivan, or not a minivan, but a, an RV to drive around <laughs> yeah, Michigan yeah, and yeah. have a trailer. I think it'd be amazing. And I don't think it's silly. I mean, the celebrities, I don't mind, I don't care. Celebrities, musicians, if that is the new politics, I think it's great. It's just currency, this, the, the currency of celebrity. You need money to get into politics, and, you know, the celebrities, they cut out the middleman. Here's, my, own, yeah. here's my only question. Why in his right mind would he want to be a <laughs> senator? Right. Like, you're going to go down there and have to deal with all these total pains and the, you know what, my only issue with him is... Can we stop calling him a country music star? That's not country music. Every, anything that's ever come out of that man's mouth is not country. Did he start as country music? No, he started as a rap artist, actually, and a DJ. His original entry into the music business was as a DJ. Although, I think country music fans do like him. He, that's the broad appeal of Kid Rock. He's got the metal fans, he's got the country, <laughs> they're he's fans, got everything. They're fans, but they ain't country music fans. Yeah, they Whatever get, they're listening to ain't country music. You don't your definition of country music's a little restrictive, do you? I mean, maybe this is a yes. 
it, issue. It is very restrictive because <laughs> I don't believe in this kind of party um, in the ta riding, in, riding in the tailgate pop that is churned out of Nashville. An ideologue. No, yes. I see. I, I think I'm it's time ideologue. to make Kid Rock great again. Then he's he's slipped and he's bringing back. Right. I think he's done with the party too. I mean, he's been partying for a long time. Maybe that's why he wants to go to the Senate. Uh huh. Well, yeah. wait, then there's The Rock. Fans of Dwayne The Rock Johnson have filed papers with the FEC to draft the former pro wrestler for president. President in 2020. Uh, would you want to smell what The Rock could be cooking in the White House, Tom Salou? <laughs> Why not? Again, in this age of celebrity, Donald Trump is the president. It's over, everybody. It's like, it's a new era. Celebrities and politics, it's, it's all crossed over. Mm. And The Rock, I mean, I don't even know what his politics is. I'm, when I look at him, I think, he's got to be conservative, right? I mean, he's The Rock. <laughs> hey, we want to share this picture, because we're used to seeing you on late night shows, but it looks like you've headed in a different direction. Tell us about uh, you. Okay, you guys, let's, let's wrap it up, you TV goobers. You're about the only thing worse than the celebrities running politics or the idiots on your local corporate-owned television news stations talking about it and talking about it and talking about it James why are you talking about it I feel compelled to put this on the record and we've spoken about it in passing through this past week but when we hit Friday's media memes edition of your morning monarchy I feel it's probably good to put it on the record and it can just go to ridiculous levels Fragger rock in 2020 Cyrus Bieber I'm, uh, they're gonna have to age a couple of years before I think they're allowed however Best line out of the chat that I've seen so far. You can see this probably coming up on a campaign slogan. <laughs> Keith, you should probably trademark Dwayne the Swamp. That's good stuff. So we live in Troll America. Let's now just put the capper on this. So I went out the other day to go grab some pizza at a local place, grabbing a couple pies and pints. And in the place that I went to, and actually it's where we met our new friend Dimitri when he was passing through Portland recently, a media monarchy listener. We met up, and actually, Cassie and Dimitri got there first, and he was like, who picked this place? That was me. Sorry. It's nearby. It's a local pizza place. But good lord, there are a lot of TVs in there, as you've probably seen in certain places. So I'm up there looking at the 18 television screens, none of which, of course, have any audio, none of which have the captions turned on, and hardly ever does anyone have the correct ratio set. Again, this is the world that's going to figure everything out, but couldn't figure out the proper ratios of your TVs once everything went HD. So I'm looking up and I see this tour of the two guys who are going to beat each other up next month. Now, I may be mentioned when this first started to get hyped, I reached out to my sports ball buddy who I used to work with at the commercial radio station. I was like, oh, UFC guy's going to kick boxing guy's ass, right? And he said, no, 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 no. If it's a boxing match, the boxing guy is going to win. If it was the ultimate punching, the ultimate punching guy's going to win. So I guess they're going on this tour. Conor McGregor, the former UFC guy. UFC, of course, recently sold out to the William Morris Agency. That's why it's becoming that much bigger hyped bit. They're just doing this basic, like, hype tour. Now, we've seen in the past where you have the official weighing in. And that's where the two guys and all their posses are there, and they weigh in, and they might spit at each other, but that's it. They're doing this every other day and traveling all around and just yelling at each other. And it basically looks like a bunch of rap inspired hypey bullshit cassie however even loved the part when you looked really closely at conor mcgregor's pinstripe suit and the upcoming showdown between floyd mayweather and conor mcgregor will easily be one of the highest rated and most anticipated events of 2017 i mean let's be real it could be the most anticipated fight of the past half decade the two showstoppers have been trading jabs back and forth for nearly two years now, and this week the two fighters have been teasing us all with press conferences promoting their August 26th bout. On Monday, their press run in LA caught plenty of fans by surprise, but not simply by their respective trash talk, but how far each individual is willing to take theirs. Pretty Boy Floyd was his usual self, providing unique commentary and shared a hilarious moment when he didn't know exactly what was going on. They say old dogs, they don't learn on your tricks, but you know, hunter dogs, they're always going to be ending catching the rabbit, and you're going to be ending catching the rabbit. You are the winner. You're the champion. I don't know what you said, but you said, thank you. I know you said I'm the winner. And I'm the champion. I like that. <laughs> I don't know what you said, but thank you. <laughs> the chocolate, the rabbit, the, the whatever you said. I that's, like that. That, that, that sounds racist. For Connor, his trash talk has been well documented throughout this entire process, and the amount of detail he takes into provoking the champ has been on full display. Nothing was more noteworthy than his not safe for work suit that he sported on Monday with the phrase. Few detail throughout. 
Complex's own Carissa Sanchez got an exclusive interview with the designer of the suit, Davis August Hill, and he explained how he first met the MMA superstar. We were introduced to Connor by our other long-standing clients, Lorenzo Fertitta and UFC president Dana White. For a few years now, we've been creating these custom suits for Connor's various events and press opportunities. So we were honored when he asked us to design his entire wardrobe for the Maymock World Tour and to be a small part of this epic story in sports. Hill has a large clientele that ranges from Kobe Bryant to DJ Khaled. With McGregor's suit, they wanted to provide a certain blend of tradition and the bravado that McGregor boasts. There you have it. And there's more of that clip, just like there seems to be more of every single clip I have. And again, everything we say and play will be included in the show notes. The suit, you gotta see it. Now, that might be cover art today. The celebrities, yes, they are quite full of themselves. And they have a long history of being managed and handled by outside interests, by managers, by firms, by consultants. They will be completely manageable. That's why somebody like Trump is president. He's, his entire life is all laid out bare. So will someone like Kid Rock. So will someone like The Rock. It's all on social media. It's all on the movies. They are a completely known entity. Now just smile and read the cue cards, Ronnie. We've had it before as a president. We will have it again as a president. And as long as you continue to put your faith in phony puppet presidents, we'll continue to swim around in this freaking mess that we have. But damn, what a good-looking pinstripe suit. You couldn't tell if you were looking on TV, but if you get really close in, the pinstripes themselves all just say, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, July 14th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Last Friday, we talked about the fantastic work that Tom Secker busted out dealing with the military and Hollywood. And it's actually not just Tom Secker, but he teamed up with Matthew Alford. And they've got a new book called National Security Cinema, and they have busted out an amazing amount of FOIA documents that show what is really going on in the movies. And we talked about this a bit last week. That was last week's cover art. All the Holly weirdos sitting in the cave and the shadows from Transformers and Hulks and such being cast on the wall. So there's a really interesting piece on Mondo Vice that begins with the new work from Tom Secker and Matthew Alford, but extrapolates it out to one of the biggest films playing right now. And that's Wonder Woman. There's been plenty of guffawing at Middle East countries, including Lebanon, for seeking to ban Wonder Woman because it stars Gal Gadot, an Israeli beauty queen turned actress who plays the title role. In fact, it's quite understandable that the Lebanese might object to a film heavily promoting Gadot as the world's savior, given that she served in the Israeli army, one that brutally occupied parts of their country for two decades until 2000, and continues to maintain a belligerent occup occupation of the Palestinians. But there's also the undeniably irony to Godot playing an Amazonian goddess who opposes the militarism of men and cannot bear to see the suffering of children in war when in real life she publicly cheered the Israeli army's massive bombardment in 2014 of the imprisoned population of Gaza, which led to the killing of some 500 Palestinian kids. But more importantly, it's not just that Godot, a former IDF soldier, is now the face of Wonder Woman. It's that the film's superhero character, too perfectly embodies the shared militaristic values of the Israeli Defense Forces and the American Pentagon. If there's one film whose script suggests it was jointly engineered by the Pentagon and Israeli Army, it's Wonder Woman. You can even look at the posters and see that it is set in World War. Yay, now women get pandered to. Yes, you can be just as murderous as men. Congratulations, mission accomplished. The film is set near the end of the First World War, a cataclysmic confrontation between two colonial powers, Britain and Germany, each trying to assert its dominance in Europe. The filmmakers blur their focus sufficiently to gloss over the problem that there were no good guys in that war to end all wars. Instead, in true Hollywood fashion, the First World War is simply presented as a prelude or a prequel, if you like, to the Second World War and the rise of the Nazis. Germans are murderous villains, while the British are flawed, until Godot shows them the error of their ways, defenders of humanity. In fact, the film prefers to cast the anti-German side as allies, the humane members of the world community represented by the U.S., Chris Pine as the male lead in Godot's love interest, and a ragtag support group that includes a Scot, a Native American, a generic Arab, presumably symbolizing moderate Arab states like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Jordan. 
The British leadership is trying to find a way to make peace and end the war, but is stymied by an evil presence. A German super general, Eric Ludendorff, played by Danny Houston, believes he can win the war decisively by developing a horrifying gas that will wipe out men, women, and children, forcing the Brits to surrender on his terms. To demonstrate his power, he tests the gas on innocent villagers on the front lines in Belgium. All this might sound disconcertingly familiar to anybody who's been following the Western media scripted coverage that has for several years been trying to promote a more aggressive humanitarian intervention in Syria, and before that, more successfully, in Libya and Iraq. Is Ludendorff supposed to be Assad, the evil Syrian president who, as long as we discount the dissenting voices of some experts, has twice used chemical weapons, sarin, against innocent civilians? Oh, sidebar, sarin gas missing from Dugway Proving Ground. I had that on the stack yesterday, but it just didn't fit into yesterday's episode. Are the British leaders seeking a peace deal with the Germans supposed to be those appeasers in the West who've stood in the way of intervention in Syria, blocking no-fly zones and bombing runs that could bring down the Syrian government? And an even more disturbing, if now outdated, parallel, given the film's aggressive identity politics, is Wonder Woman, the Amazonian who brings peace through overpowering military violence. She's a stand-in for Hillary. When the movie was in production, the filmmakers must have assumed it would be released as Clinton was enjoying her early months in office as the first female America's Next Top President. The use of Wonder Woman to justify Clinton's well-documented bloodlust would have proved timely had the U.S. election turned out differently. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed videos. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. So there's that classic clip. He came, we came, we saw, he died. That's Hillary gloating over the death of Gaddafi. And how's, how's Libya doing right now? Well, if I remember a recent episode of New World Next Week, I believe it's now opened up the, uh, opened up the world for slavery. Slave markets now doing Bafo box office in Libya. Wonder Woman is a hero only the military-industrial complex could create fantastic piece from Jonathan Cook that there is more to, and we'll include that, of course, in the show notes, and that's originally on Mondo Vice. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy, and we're continuing to look at ways that the powers that shouldn't be manipulate the entertainment that shouldn't be. The latest reports from the U.S. Army's Entertainment Liaison Office brings us almost up to date on their activities, which includes support to everything from the film Jackie to History Channel documentaries and The Ellen DeGeneres Show. One continued theme is the military support not just for cookery programs, but also for their corollary, competitive weight loss reality TV game shows. I do wonder why it is that the military supports so many cooking or food or chef-based TV programs, but also support a number of weight loss series too. Is this just a reflection of the fundamental contradiction in our popular culture between food addiction and body shaming, or is there more to it? For example, the older Army Entertainment Liaison Office reports have a bunch of entries on The Biggest Loser. Season 9 of the competitive weight-losing extravaganza featured not only the heaviest contestant ever, but also the heaviest couple. I'm guessing that during the pitch meetings, at least one person made a, we're gonna need a bigger boat joke. Also, given the restrictions of the format, you can't blame them for running out of ideas and giving up and saying, can't we just get even fatter people? One contestant... Not one of the record-breaking behemoths mentioned above, was the wife of a soldier based at Fort Bragg. She was eliminated during the earlier rounds, but the rejected chubby still work towards their weight loss goal so they can come back for the series finale and have people make the same comments they made for the last six years about how much better they look. As such, the military had a stake in having their chubby achieve her goal, even after being dumped off the show like a wheelbarrow full of yesterday's rancid lard. I believe this is being written by the aforementioned Tom Secker over on spyculture.com, his own website. The Entertainment Liaison Reports record show how they saw this as an opportunity and assigned a master fitness trainer, a nutritionist, and an army culinary arts specialist, a chef, from Fort Bragg to help the contestant lose weight. It seems that a lot of effort, a lot of effort to go for one portly lady, it's because it is. The Army reports make explicit their aim in doing this, saying that as part of this project, they will incorporate comprehensive soldier fitness into the messaging of the show. They also signed up to allow the producers to go to Fort Bragg to record a video package to be played during the live finale and try to arrange with her husband's Army unit to have him use his mid-tour leave to turn up on set during the finale and surprise his wife. The U.S. Army is using fat people for entertainment. 
And nearly every other day when we do the This Day in History and we look at the stories posted to MediaMonarchy.com in the past, we constantly see the military lowering lowering its statutes, lowering its ideals, lowering the requirements for what it takes to join the meat grinder. And that is our entertainment world. It is disguised as though it's all just, a, oh, it's just, oh, that's just your neighbor. Oh, it's just, you know, anybody could run for president. It is all very well stage managed. And when you look behind the scenes, you can generally see, oh, you're the son of this and the daughter of that. They are multi-generational serial killers. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Plato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so very much more. Mika Brzezinski, that's right, the daughter of former National Security Advisor to Carter, National Security Director to Carter, huge advisor to Barry Satoro. His daughter poses as a newsreader. And she has a popular show on the Microsoft General Electric Broadcasting Network. Mika Brzezinski Inc.'s three-book deal. The deal comes after the Morning Joe co-host was thrust into the national spotlight when the president tweeted a personal attack on Joe Scarborough, her co-anchor and fiancé. Mika Brzezinski has inked a new three-book deal with Weinstein Books. There's the Weinsteins again. The publisher confirmed to The Hollywood Reporter on Tuesday morning. A spokeswoman for Weinstein Books would not provide any details about the arrangement, first reported by the New York Post, page 6, which said the deal includes two new books coming out fall 2018, as well as a revised edition of her 2011 book, Knowing Your Value, Women, Money, and Getting What You're Worth, which was also published by the company. The Post report said the value of the deal is in the high six figures. Brzezinski was thrust into the national spotlight, which I don't know how you're not already in the national spotlight when you co-host a popular-ish cable show. Thrust into the national spotlight June 29th when the president tweeted a personal attack on her and her Morning Joe co-anchor and finance, Joe Scarborough. The pair will appear on, I guess already did it, appeared on old Colbert. Is he still playing a character? I can't exactly, I can't keep up if Colbert is continuing to play the character he used to play. Or if the pendulum swung the other way and he's now acting like a different thing. Brzezinski's ongoing spat with the president isn't seen as the primary reason behind the deal, but she is expected to address it in the new edition of Knowing Your Value. Morning Joe co-host Mika Brzezinski has signed on to a three-book publishing deal with Weinstein Books. The news comes after the morning news host was thrust into the spotlight when President Donald Trump tweeted a personal attack on her and her co-anchor Joe Scarborough, who is also her fiancé. A spokeswoman for Weinstein Books would not provide any details about the arrangement. The New York Post's Page Six first reported that the deal includes two new books coming out in the fall of 2018, as well as a revised version of her 2011 book, Knowing Your Value, Women, Money, and Getting What You're Worth. Now, we have all your hottest memes. Now, as we noted earlier, Courage Sower said Dwayne the Swamp would make a fantastic political slogan, and it would. Our buddy Darren over in Liverpool, who gives us a lot of fantastic news via the tweets, I think he should also probably trademark his idea for Mika Brzezinski's book. It should be called The Grand Checkerboard. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Palato for MediaMonarchy.com, continuing to look at what they dare to call fake news, the news industry is to band together to seek a limited antitrust exemption from Congress in an effort to fend off growing competition from Friendface and the Alphabet Incorporated. Traditional competitors include the Bezos Post, the Murdoch Street Journal, and the Old Grey Lady, as well as a host of smaller print and online publications, will temporarily set aside their differences this week and appeal to federal lawmakers to let them negotiate collectively with the tech giants to safeguard the industry. Antitrust laws traditionally prevent companies from forming such an alliance, which could see them becoming overdominant in a particular sector. However, the media companies will be hoping that Congress will look favorably upon a temporary exemption. May, what is it? May, is that the Hunger Games thing? May, something favorably upon your endeavors? Yeah, whatever, something like that. Particularly given the recent clampdown on the technology industry, which saw Google slapped with a $2.7 billion antitrust fine. 
The campaign is led by newspaper industry trade group News Media Alliance, and it is intended to help the industry collaborate in order to regain market share from Facebook and Google, which have been swooping in on newspapers' distribution and advertising revenues. The two companies currently command 70% of the $73 billion digital advertising industry in the U.S., according to new research from the Pew Research Center. Pew, pew! Meanwhile, U.S. newspaper ad revenue in 2016 was $18 billion from $50 billion a decade ago. So that's down a little bit. The News Media Alliance argues that despite their growing dominance in news distribution, Facebook and Google lack the resources and ability to guarantee the accuracy of reporting upheld by reputable news associations. Reputable news associations that tell you, don't worry if your leaders are all meeting in secret to decide things. Don't worry if we're telling you again and again and again that there's weapons of mass destruction. David Chavern, president and chief executive of the News Media Alliance, wrote in an opinion piece published this past Sunday in the Wall Street Journal, quote, Facebook and Google don't employ reporters. They don't dig through public records to uncover corruption, send correspondence into war zones, or attend last night's game to get the highlights. They expect an economically squeezed news industry to do that costly work for them. The only way publishers can address this inexorable threat is by banding together. If they open a unified front to negotiate with Google and Facebook, pushing for stronger intellectual property protections, better support for subscription models, and a fair share of revenue and data, they could build a more sustainable future for the news business. Now, we said it before, we'll say it again. How do you make money telling it like it is? You don't tell it like it is. And that's why the dinosaurs are crumbling. And there will continue to be people who go file those reports, who go to the game to get the highlights, who go look at the paperwork. They just won't be run by multinational organizations. They'll be run by more trustworthy, regular people who do the work. If you like the work they do, you'll support it. If you don't, you won't. Ta-da! Continuing to look at the media memes, my friends, a community radio station has been taken off the air for broadcasting more than 25 hours of lectures by an alleged Al-Qaeda leader. Sheffield-based Imam FM had its license suspended by Ofcom for playing the lectures by radical American Muslim cleric Anwar al-Awlaki. The regulator said parts of the material was likely to encourage or incite crime or lead to disorder. Imam FM told Ofcom that it was not aware of Awlaki's background. In 2011, the United Nations Security Council described Al-Laki as a leader, recruiter, and trainer for Al-Qaeda I mean Al in the Arabian Peninsula. His sermons are thought to have inspired terrorist attacks, including this one and that one and the other thing. Sheffield-based radio station Imam FM, which is pretty clever sounding, suspended over their terror talks. Now, I very seriously doubt any of us have ever listened to any of those. Speaking of things we've never listened to, here are some things we've never watched. Gangnam Style is one of the weirdest videos on this platform, and for five years, it was also the most viewed. Psy is a South Korean pop star, and his song Gangnam Style was a global smash hit. It had close to 3 billion views on YouTube. 2,894,426,427 to be precise. It seems impossible to think that that amount could be surpassed, but it was. So what video managed to beat Gangnam Style? YouTube's most viewed video is now See You Again by Wiz Khalifa and Charlie Puth. Oh, come on, you know See You Again. It's no. been a long yeah, day no, I don't at all. without stop. you, my stop. friend. Stop, stop saying it. And I'll tell stop. you all Please. about Just, it no, when I, I don't. see you I don't want again. Any. Great song. Very catchy. At the time this video was filmed, it has at least 10 million more views than Gangnam Style. It is about to surpass 3 billion views. For those that don't know the song, See You Again was written for the Fast and the Furious films. The song played out during the closing credits as a tribute to Paul Walker, who died before the Fast and the Furious 7 was completed. When he heard the news, Charlie Puth tweeted, For the record, I joined YouTube in 2007, hoping to make a video that would reach 10,000 views. So why do people love this song so much? Well, partially it's because of the death of Paul Walker. And secondly, it became a popular song for funerals. See You Again isn't only YouTube's most viewed video, it also bagged six awards and made it to number one in 26 countries. Congratulations to Charlie Puth and Wiz Khalifa, and rest in peace, Paul Walker. <laughs> You're getting just angrier and dumber by the moment on this morning, Monarchy. I apologize for that. No, I've never heard that song. Never heard of any of that stuff, but the Paul Walker stuff, is that's, that's kind of funny. 
perhaps even sadder than that? An acrobat plunged to his death right before Green Day set at the Mad Cool Festival last Friday night. A fan shot video shows Pedro and Nune Monroy, age 42, performing in a brightly lit cube suspended about 100 feet in the air above the stage before falling. According to The Independent, he appeared to be wearing a harness at the time. Green Day took the stage shortly after the accident, apparently unaware anything had happened. After their set, of course, the band acknowledged the tragedy. A terrible tragedy occurred at the Mad Cool Festival in Spain on Friday night when an aerial acrobat died in a horrific accident just prior to Green Day's headlining performance. 42-year-old Pedro Monroy was suspended 100 feet above the stage in a transparent box when a harness apparently snapped leading him to fall to his death. After a delay, Green Day took the stage to perform their entire set and subsequently received backlash from some fans for not canceling the show out of respect for the deceased acrobat. However, frontman Billy Joe Armstrong released a statement explaining that Green Day were never informed of the tragedy and only found out about Monroy's death after their set, adding that the band was heartbroken. Now, this is generally the case when things like this happen. The infamous crowd crush at the Who concert many decades ago. The band never knew anything about it. In a lot of these situations, the bands know nothing about it. And of course, they're going to get yelled at either way, because we are in angry, knee-jerk, freak-out, troll America culture. You're the worst band ever! You're Hitler! I can't believe you played! We didn't know. Our managers didn't tell us. That's also the other thing. You sort of live in this little bubble. You live in this little bubble world, so whether that's rock or Kid Rock or Billy Joe or whatever. Slow Dive, however, did know about the news and they canceled their show. Our final story hits a lot of my favorite buttons on this morning monarchy. The resurgence of vinyl as a hot commodity for fans of music has, like every format, had its ups and downs. Sales of these platters are on the rise, up 26% from the year before, according to Analytics providing a nice shot in the arm for indie stores and online retailers. But for every bit of sweet wax that gets released, there's an equal number of wholly unnecessary records that feels less like answering a customer's prayers than it does dudes in a boardroom trying to ride this out until it sputters. Like repressings of Aqua's Barbie Girl that was part of this year's Record Store Day festivities. Yeah, the gold rush is on for Record Store Day. One of the more surprising outcroppings of this new vinyl economy has been the demand for soundtrack releases. Over the past five years or so, a number of boutique labels have emerged, re-releasing the scores and soundtracks from a wide array of films, often pressed to colored wax and housed in lovingly designed new packaging. It's become such a cottage industry that longtime major players in the business, like Universal and longtime soundtrack label Varese Sarabands, have started getting in on the fun too, with offerings such as the recently announced repressing of the Bowie starring Labyrinth, with three color options available, or the prairie sand colored first time vinyl release of Lenny Niehaus' score for the 1992 western Unforgiven. While some of this growing activity has to do with both major musicians like Jeff Barrow of Portishead or Trent Reznor of the soon-to-be-heard-in-a-few-minutes Nine Inch Nails, recording scores for films and making many producers and artists taking up the influence of movie music up on their work, which has been fanning the small bonfire and the rise of geek and collector culture. The majority of vinyl soundtracks that have been released in recent years tend to be the scores or songs from horror, sci-fi, and cult films. And the people who bankroll these ventures often come from the world that sets up shop at Comic-Con every year, and they are serious cinephiles. One of the biggest, awesomest players in the field is Mondo. And I actually have Mondo release, is it number three, I think? They put out the Oblivion soundtrack that M83 did for the Tom Cruise movie from several years ago. I was actually just talking about Mondo and some of these horror soundtrack reissues with Cassie just the other day. We have a pretty good track record of talking about something, and then the next day it's in the news. Mondo got its start not through releasing music, but by printing up geeky t-shirts and freshly designed variant movie posters that they sold at first, and you may have seen some of these at the Alamo Drafthouse Cinema in Austin, Texas. They were making new original movie posters for classics that were being rerun. Their foray into the vinyl business came as something of a lark. A lot of the things Mondo's branched out into, says Mondo's label manager Mo Shafiq, whether it's the collectible toy space or the board game space, have been experiments that have been well received. Then we go, oh, I guess we can do this now, huh? Their first experiment, a vinyl issue of the soundtrack to the 1980 cult slasher film Maniac. 
was released in a small press run during the 2011 Fantastic Fest, which is in Austin, quickly snapped up by attendees. Shafiq, a former road manager for pop punk and emo bands, was then pushed into the role of looking after this new venture, which by 2013 had ramped up considerably. They basically did 12 records in 2013, a record a month. One hurdle that Mondo had to leap was convincing some of the stakeholders involved with the films that there was a market for these records. When they reached out to Universal to discuss licensing the music for Jurassic Park for a vinyl release, the initial response, according to Shafiq, was, no one's going to buy that. It took a couple of emails to get them to come around, and when they did, it was kind of like, eh, it's your money, I guess. The story behind the surge in vinyl film soundtracks, how Mondo and other labels took a gamble on cinematic wax, and they look good. Oh, God, you know, we talk about on the Daily DJ set on Pump Up the Volume, Milan Records is one of our favorite new film score releasers. Warp Records, also, you know, famed electronic label, Boards of Canada, Aphex Twin, and the rest. They have a huge side label distro arm. Amazing. It's it, it's vinyl porn. It is it's 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 good looking stuff. Splatter soundtracks is the way we start to wrap up this media memes edition. Our buddy Darren gets us another fantastic screen grab from Reuters on their tweets. Thirty years on, you two still find relevance in the Joshua Tree, and the accompanying picture is Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. It is Friday, which means a new music Friday, which means there are brand new records out today from Shabazz Palaces, Japanese Breakfast, Waxahashi, Low Tom, all bands that we have played on Pump Up the Volume, and we will have brand spanking new music from the aforementioned Nine Inch Nails. Now, I almost said, actually, on the latest episode of New World Next Week, we were talking about people suing Donald Trump for blocking them on Twitter. It was like, yeah, get over it. I'm blocked by Trent Reznor. I'm blocked by Roseanne Barr. It's not too tough to get blocked by people on Twitter, who, of course, are pretty uptight. Nine Inch Nails has a brand new upcoming EP. It comes out a week from today, and it's called Ad Violence, which Nine Inch Nails always generally seems to be a fan of. We're going to hear a song called Less Than, brand new music from Nine Inch Nails as we wrap up this Morning Monarchy episode. But of course, first, my friends, this day in history. Past his prologue, July 14th, 1874, the Chicago Fire of 1874 burns down 47 acres of the city, destroying 812 buildings, killing 20, and resulting in the fire insurance industry, because that's what it's all about, demanding municipal reforms from Chicago Lands City Council. July 14th, 1877, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 begins in the Dirty Burg. Martinsburg, West Virginia, when the Baltimore and Ohio railroad workers have their wages cut for the second time in a year. Cassie actually used to live, and her parents lived up until a few years ago, next to the Martinsburg train station. That's actually how she moved out here to Portland. She left the left her parents' house and walked across the street to the train station and rode it out here to Portland. July 14th, 1881, Billy the Kid is shot and killed by Pat Garrett outside of Fort Sumner. And July 11th, or rather July 14th, 1911, Harry Atwood, an exhibition pilot for the Wright Brothers, lands his plane on the south lawn of the White House. He's later awarded a gold medal from U.S. President William Howard Taft for this feat. And later on, of course, people would be arrested for such a feat. July 14th, 1933, the Nazi eugenics begins with the proclamation of the law for the prevention of hereditary diseased offspring that calls for the compulsory sterilization of any citizen who suffers from alleged genetic disorders. Where, oh where, did those Nazis get that idea? Oh, they got it from the West. They got it from Margaret Sanger. That's why they gave her awards for her fantastic ideas, which they took on and put into action. July 14th, 1943, in Diamond, Missouri, the George Washington Carver National Monument becomes the first United States National Monument in honor of an African American. July 14th, 1969, they call it the Football War. After Honduras loses a soccer match against El Salvador, riots break out against Hon er, in Honduras against Salvadoran migrant workers. Oh, sports ball. July 14th, that same day, 1969, the United States took 500, 1,000, 5,000, and $10,000 bills out of circulation. That's why you can hardly ever find a $1,000 bill. July 14th, 1973, the Everly Brothers announced their breakup during their show at Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park, California. 1984, Philip Wynn, former lead singer of The Spinners, well, he, he was the 
singer at the time. He's a performer now. He died of a heart attack on stage in Oakland, California. July 14th, one of my favorites from Prince, You Got the Look, was released on this day in 87. 1989, Cindy Lauper released the first closed caption music video. The video was for the song My First Night Without You. July 14th, 1995, this day in George Michael history, he announced the settlement of his long-running dispute with Sony and that he had been released from his contract. July 14th, 2002, to think about this while America's next top president is over in France. July 15th, 2002, French President Jacques Chirac escapes an assassination attempt unscathed during Bastille Day celebrations. And July 14th, 2015, two years ago today, NASA's New Horizons probe performs the first flyby of Pluto, thus completing the initial survey of the solar system. It's hard to believe, but until only recently, this was one of the clearest images we had of Pluto. But that's all changing. The dwarf planet will come into focus for the first time on July 14th, when the New Horizons spacecraft will come within 7,500 miles of Pluto, finally able to take a clear picture. These animations you're seeing are just NASA's best guess as to what it might look like close up. But the images New Horizons will take are the equivalent of snapping a photo out of your car on the highway. The spacecraft will buzz by the dwarf planet at 10 miles per second, in optimal observation range for only a short time. Then, the speedy little vessel will hurtle beyond our planetary solar system. And that is when things really get interesting. Although we tend to think of Pluto as the last stop before a whole lot of nothing, it's actually part of a disk-shaped region called the Kuiper Belt that's home to three dwarf planets and roughly 35,000 other objects larger than 60 miles wide. Most of these orbiting bodies are known as cold classicals. They're essentially the building blocks of planets, some of the most pristine objects in our solar system, and we've never seen one up close. Pending NASA approval of an extended mission, New Horizons will be the first spacecraft to enter the Kuiper Belt with the intention of actually visiting a cold classical. By finally observing one up close, we can better illuminate the process of how planets form, which in turn will help our understanding of the origin of our solar system. Your extended mission has been canceled. Now, I'm not sure if that's actually true, but on this day, July 14th, NASA's New Horizons probe performed the first flyby of Pluto. Pff, yeah, that's if you still believe in the highway. Now, I always love, and I, uh, it's, 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 it's difficult to do. I take one look at the comments on the New World Next Week episodes. I expand everything out, I hit read more, I hit view all replies, I kind of take a quick stroll, scroll down that page and kind of glance at everything, foolishly hoping I can maybe find some insight into how I could have done a better job. I love all the time people speculating about, oh, it looks like Pilato thinks this or that, or... I didn't know, because it wasn't in the show notes, I didn't know Corbett was going to go on a flat earth rant at the end of that episode. So when people say, oh, it looks like Pilato didn't know what's, what's happening. Yeah, I didn't know he was going to say, fuck you, flat earthers. <laughs> and once he went on that rant, I was like, I, I got nothing to add to that. I was only going to joke. I'll brace myself for the reaction from all the flat earthers that we're going to get as we wrap up this episode. Speaking of wrapping up this episode, last bits on this day in history. One year ago today, July 14th, 2016, a terrorist vehicular attack in Nice, France, kills 86 and injures over 400 others. Again, that's a year ago in France. Watch the anniversaries. Watch the Twilight language. Watch the copycat effect. Celebrating birthdays today, July 14th, Gustav Klimt, Austrian painter and illustrator, born on this day in 1862, and it is Woody Guthrie's birthday Born on this day in 1912. It's also Gerald Stumbly Ford's birthday. He brought us a lot of bad things for the powers that shouldn't be. The amazing Harry Dean Stanton, born on this day in 1926. Also celebrating birthdays today, Nancy Olson. She's in Sunset Boulevard. She's the girl that our guy should have gone with. Holly Bergen, born on this day. Rosie Greer, who you might remember as being a football player, a singer, an actor, and also the giant football player who couldn't knock the gun out of a little four-foot Palestinian guy's hand. Jerry Rubin, activist, author, and businessman, born on this day. It's also Sony devil Tommy Mottola's birthday. Bob Casale, 
the late great Bob Casale from Devo, and it's also Kyle Gass from the D, born on this day. Cassie and I were talking, I'll, I'll tell her some of the birthdays as she's getting ready for work and heading out the door. I don't know, does the D stand for anything on Tenacious D? I'm not sure about that. It's also Jane Lynch's birthday. Bad News Bears and Preacher star Jackie Earl Haley born on this day and Matthew Fox. I don't think any of those folks are going to make it into our daily DJ set at noon because it is a new music Friday. However, one other birthday note to make. Huge happy birthday to our good buddy Matt from Convince Yourself Media. A huge thanks to him. I've got to meet with him a couple of times. He is a good buddy to MediaMonarchy.com and we wish him well. We also wish him really well on his quitting smoking. Tomorrow will be five years to the day since I quit smoking cigarettes. Cold turkey never touched him since. Then we send out the love and help for our buddy Matt at Convince Yourself Media to not only have another awesome year, another trip around the sun, but to also make those decisions that you know make you better, make you a healthier, stronger, better person. And that's why we like to reach out to each other and be together and not do this in some fear-free way and you're stupid and sheeple and idiots and rah, 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 rah. I may talk about some of the negative stuff with Cassie, and she does kind of get a, get a kick out of when I tell her people love the positivity of the show. Maybe sometimes the negativity comes out before the show. But when the mic goes on and the red light comes on, I want to be good. I want to I want to put on my best my best face for you as we continue to, as our buddy Richard Grove says, learn our way forward. And that wraps up another week of Morning Monarchies. I really wish you'd tell a friend about us. We're not as popular as you think. We'd love for you to spread the word about independent, non-commercial alternative media. Going out with brand new music from Nine Inch Nails. It's called Less Than. And that wraps up the Media Memes edition of your Morning Monarchy for Bastille Day, Friday, July 14th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Again, thanking you from the bottom of my heart for listening, for taking part. And reminding you, as always, my friends, like Jello Biafra said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.